Now there's seed starting Saturday here at the Gardener's Workshop Farm. And my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, if we've never met before. And, um, you know, I jump on here on Saturdays during this seed starting time to kind of carry you guys along with me. Um, we don't really do any um, anything special. I'm just sharing kind of what we do here. So today I'm actually um, going to be sowing three trays and one of them, one, two of them actually, are going to be backup crops, meaning um, I planted them out in the fall there from those group of cool season hardy annuals known as cool flowers. And to be real honest, when I did my little run through the farm before this latest winter storm that we have right now, um, I'm in the mid-Atlantic, so we kind of caught the cusp of that nor'easter that just went through. We got about four or five inches of snow. Um, so I went out this past week and kind of took covers down and did a little run-through video. And what I, the conclusion that I came to is there's a couple of crops that didn't look so hot. They're kind of on the fence of whether they're really winter hardy here for me. So I'm gonna restart them today. And that would be Craspedia, which is Billy Balls, um, and also Godisha. And then I am gonna be doing a little experiment with stock. Um, stock is a cool season hardy annual that we don't actually plant in the fall. We um, plant it in very early spring. And if you're not familiar with this whole cool season gardening thing, how to really bring cool season hardy annuals into your garden, no matter where you live, um, there is cool season hardy annuals for you to plant. We can all plant them. We just plant them at different timing, perhaps, right? So. I wrote a book about the flowers that are in this family called Cool Flowers, and that'll really explain the concept um, about it. And there's lots of veggies that also fall into that category. So this morning, um, I'm just kind of, there's a couple things I just wanted to say. Um, so if you wanna um, get our weekly farm news, we include in that, I really, it comes out once a week on Wednesdays at four o'clock, and it's like a highlight of all the latest and greatest, lots of content, perhaps how to do something. Um, anyway, one of the things that we include in that email each week is a chilling video. And that's just kind of like a 30 to 60 second long video of something going on here in the farm. And we also include videos from many of my students from their farms. It's kind of stuff that you would just chill out and watch for a few minutes or a few seconds actually. And my cool flower walkabout was actually the chilling video this last week. And all the chilling videos are on one page. So if you sign up for our news, you'll get access to that and you can look back through them. So that's really um, a fun thing. So, Today, um, I am going to make some blocks just for anybody that hasn't um, seen how we seed start. I'm gonna share kind of how I do it um, with soil blocks here. And good morning to everybody. And if you guys have comments, um, you can leave them and I will try to answer them at the end. Um, I haven't quite figured that out on YouTube yet, but if you type your comments in, have questions, I will go back and do my best to answer them for you. So I've already made two trays and I'm gonna make another one. Um, so if you're not familiar with soil blocking, again, over on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, tons of information, y'all. We have a learning center with lots of, um, our video guide is back up. We just got a new website about, or a rebuild of our website about two or three weeks ago. And we're slowly getting, we're getting a lot of special features on it and the video guides are back up. There's lots of frequently asked question, little short videos you can watch and learn about it. And of course our online store is there where you can get seed starting equipment as well as soil blocking equipment. So um, soil blocking does take a different mix than what most people are used to. Um, the recipe is on our website on that learning center under all things soil blocking as well as we sell the ready-made mix. So I'm gonna turn it down so you guys can see actually what I am doing here. Yep, you can see me. 
So um, I'm not sure if you can tell or not, but you can see there is a little bit of moisture standing here in the bottom of the tub. Um, soil blocking mix, you get much wetter than you do with regular seed starting when you're using a plug tray or something like that. Um, it's one part blocking mix, I'm sorry, three part blocking mix to one part water. And so this is really, really, really moist. This is a potato masher for anybody that doesn't recognize that. And this is the best tool I have found for incorporating the water into the blocking mix because it's a lot like um, mixing concrete, right? Um, kind of how you use a hoe to do that. It's a lot the same. So this is the trays that I'm gonna use. These are our um, English trays that we go in and out of stock of these all the time, y'all. So I apologize if you have a hard time catch it up with them. Um, they are, they were at least in stock yesterday when we um, left the office. But these hold either five or six clusters of this 20 of blocks. Um, and it's just a perfect size for the size garden that we're growing now as a small, would be compared to a small market garden. Um, so we are gonna put 100 blocks on there. <clears throat> And you can see that I push the blocker down into the mix a couple of times just to be sure that the um, chambers are really nice and full. And so I'm just gonna slide my hands under and give up using my palm to push the, pl uh, the plunger and um, lifting up. And you can see this is a little bit wetter than it should be, but I will share a secret with you that it is far easier to make blocks with the soil being a little moister than it should be than for it to be too dry. But I um, was getting this ready kind of in a hurry here. We did have, get we got snow overnight and Tucker did not want to come in out of the snow. So I was a little late. Um, so I added too much water and that's what happens. But you can see how it quickly dissipates here. Um, and when I do my mix, I always measure y'all because if you don't measure the three parts of blocking mix to one part water, then you have to guess and spend a lot of time figuring out your mix. I actually added more. Um, it's not uncommon to have to add a smidgen more of the, um, water than the one to three, um, but I just added too much this morning in my hurry. So this blocking mix is actually just compost, peat moss. Um, you can substitute peat moss for cocoa fiber if you'd like, um, and some nutrients. We have the recipe on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, on the Learning Center under all things soil blocking. Um, all the time, so you can make yours at home. And if you have trouble finding the nutrients locally, um, you can find them on our store um, and make your own at home. All right, so now we're gonna lose this. I'm not sure how I got my hand dirty, y'all. I think I got dirt on my blocker when I was mixing mistakenly. It's getting my hands all dirty because believe it or not, this is a pretty clean method. You can literally do it anywhere. Um, I used to actually, believe it or not, y'all, I used to actually demonstrate this um, in people's living rooms. That's a whole other story. Back when I started the gardener's workshop, we had sales reps and did workshops, and I used to do this in some of the finest living rooms around. Anyway, so here's a tray. This has got... Um, five sets of 20, so that's 100, which is exactly what I am looking to start. We like to use um, painter's tape um, to identify our what, what seeds are growing in that tray. Um, I will tell you, though, that the painter's tape is not sticking to these nice English trays like it did to the other types of plastic trays. So I'm gonna go with it. I'm gonna continue to use the blue at this point. Um, but if they come off, they're kind of peeling on the edges. We'll see how it goes. So that's just a heads up. I'll go back to mask and tape. So the first thing we're gonna start is Godisha. And 
Um, Godisha is, you know, obviously a cool season hardy annual, and this is Grace Mix. Um, I planted Godisha in the fall, not knowing if it was gonna truly be um, winter hardy. What is today? 29th. Sorry, y'all. Can't see the calendar. All right. Um, I always identify first. I mean, nothing is worse than getting... Because <laughs> if I skip it once, then I tend to skip them all, and then it's really a mess. So you don't want that to happen. So I like putting it so I can read the whole thing. All right. So Godisha. Where is Godisha? Do you cover Godisha? You do not cover the seeds of Godisha. So that means that they need light to germinate. So we're just gonna firmly and quickly seat these on the surface. And I use this little aluminum, um, oh, I forgot a toothpick, y'all. Stand by. Knew I was forgetting something. So you really need to know whether or not the seed needs to be covered because that is going to dictate whether you sow it on the surface or do you push it down into the block. So I think one of the ones that I'm, I think stock is one that can be pushed in a little bit more. So I am just going to very quickly here, picked up two. So this little aluminum seed pan, the reason I use this is aluminum has no static electricity, right? So if you've been fighting to get your seeds out of a little plastic dish you've been using, like a lot of times we use little plastic, you know, Rubbermaid stuff, that kind of those little containers, and we just don't even realize just how much we're actually chasing those little seeds around that container. So this is actually a lab pan. You can find those on our website too. They're a couple of bucks or something. It's just a super convenient thing to have. Um, doesn't take much to get me out of order here. When you're sowing, these are pretty tiny little seeds. Um, doesn't take much for you to think you know where you are and you lose your place. Um, and you know, where soil blocking is such a time saver because people say, oh my gosh, you sit there and sow a seed into each block. Yes, I do. We do. I mean, we've done a, we, when we were in high production, we would do a hundred thousand of these a year. No problem. Because here's the thing. There's, you put one seed per block. You are not thinning. You're not potting up. You eliminate so many steps for the way that we practice soil blocking. Um, we start anything that the seed will sprout and grow in the little block. We always use, I don't think I had a seed on that one. Um, we will always choose to use the small blocker because it uses so much less space and more importantly, or as important, I guess I should say, um, the volume of blocking mix that it takes, right? So that is just really, really huge. When you're a small space farmer gardener like I am. Um, and so I have moistened the end of the toothpick with saliva we have found that the combination of saliva and no, whoop, I picked up two seeds, saliva and no static electricity, it is just really just so amazing how easily and e quickly you pick up each individual seed with the toothpick. I've tried all of the seed sewing tools. None of them are, are as quick and efficient as what I'm doing right now. And um, you know, we had somebody, depending on the time of the year, there was almost always one person designated to be our seed starter. Um, and then when we were in high production, um, oftentimes there was a second person on board 
um, to also, because you know when, golly day, back when we were starting for high production, um, you know, Cox, Comb, and Zinnias, we would start four trays, big cafeteria trays, and the cafe each cafeteria tray held 240 blocks. And we would start four of those trays of each color of coxcomb, um, zinnias. Um, it just depended on what time of the year it was as to what plumes, basil. Oh, my goodness. So that's just a lot. But where the real space and time saver was is they're never thin. They don't have to be pricked out you know that's where people thin out and pull the extra little seedlings and oh my goodness that is so much work after we're done with this step all we literally do is water them feed them uh, move them from heat to light you know what i mean all the normal steps you have to do with everything anyway so it is super time saving um i had a good friend that she was you know i mean I don't want everybody to soil block. I'm just sharing with people that your circumstances are like mine where I don't have any hoop or greenhouses at all, right? Um, this is just a super easy tabletop method that you can fit in to a spare bedroom, a laundry room, a closet, literally, um, and you can start a whole lot of seedlings. Um, anyway, I had a friend that was... Um, she's, I guess this probably be her sixth or seventh year if she was growing. Um, and she always, you know, made comments that, oh gosh, you know, it looks so very cool. And, but I just don't think it'll work for me. And then finally, two years ago, she took the plunge and she was a great, and she has a home set up. She does not have any hoop or greenhouses like me either. And she had a sunroom that she was doing all of her seed starting in. And she took the plunge two years ago, and I can't even tell you how many constant messages I would get from her. Oh my gosh, Lisa, I can't believe I waited so long to do this. She was quickly pointing out to me all the attributes that were helpful to her and just how much earlier you can handle them and plant them younger, which leads to a lot of... I mean, you just literally grow them for a shorter period of time indoors under lights, which for those of us that don't have a designated space, I mean, that is just such a huge benefit. So soil blocking is not for everybody, but for those that want to do it, we're here doing it. All right, so that's all of those. So that's Godisha. So just a note about the Godisha I fall planted. I fall planted two different plantings of Godisha. And both of them don't look horrible. <clears throat> what are we gonna plant next? We're gonna plant um, drumstick. I don't know if I have enough seeds to do drumstick, but we're gonna try it. All right, so we're gonna, this is Billy Balls, which is Craspedia, which is also called Golden Drumstick. I'm not sure if I have enough seeds. but we're gonna give it a whirl. I have another package around here somewhere I saw. Um, <clears throat> the Godisha, what I really wanna learn is what is the real difference between um, fall planted and spring, very early spring. For anybody that's not familiar with um, cool flowers, the really huge advantage to fall planting anything that is winter hardy in your zone is the fact that the plants get so much more established over winter. So you typically get much more abundance. All right, y'all, I don't think I'm gonna have enough, but we're gonna go for it. These will be great because see how they're coated? I guess you can probably even see them. You'll be able to see them. And what do they get covered? Oh, they get covered. Cover soil, seed with soil. So we're gonna push these. So if you ever have a seed that says needs darkness to germinate or it says cover this is how you do it oh look at me i'm getting ready to do it without labeling y'all um so the big comparison is for the godisha 
What is the comparison to the abundance and the stem length? So I'm just putting Billy. I only grow one thing called Billy, so we'll know what that is. Um, so that'll be a great experiment. Billy balls, on the other hand, we've already done the experiment. We know that when I fall plant Craspedia, I get like 40 inch stems, y'all. I mean, you've never, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but they are not as winter hardy as most of the other things that I grow. And I will tell you that I did not cover them for our first dip into the 20s. And I don't know if they just died back or if they're coming back. So just in case, and also for a comparison, I'm planting billy balls in very early spring, and I will see what the stem length and abundance, if any of those survived, what the comparison is. So if you'll notice, I'll to make to cover, as it says on the seed packet, I'm just pushing this seed deeper down into the block. That picked up too. Um, seeds are pelleted for various different reasons. Most often, it's just a coating for the seed distributors to be able to count, put them into counting machines. Um, that's typically what that's all about. And to help them stay separated and we try to get them uncoated if we can. Doesn't always happen though, obviously, right? Some seed coatings, which we don't sell those, they're actually coated with a treatment. Sunflowers come that way, big, big sunflower growers. I mean, people that are growing for sunflower seed oil and I mean, that grow acres and acres and acres and acres, they typically direct seed. And those sunflowers are treated with a fungicide because the seeds can easily rot or get disease sprouting in cool to wet soil. Um, but we don't sell those either. The only reason I know about that is mistake, we were mistakenly shipped a huge, you know, bulk order of sunflowers and we opened them and they were like a color. They were blue. And it's like, what the heck is this? We sealed it up and called them and had to send back like a quarter of a million seeds. It was crazy. Anyway, but these are just coated. Um, we were just in a meeting last week with one of our seed distributors, and we were asking about zinnias that come coated. Um, and that's really what it's about. So our account is marked that we try our best to always get raw seed is what they call it when we can. So this is Craspedia. Billy balls is what it's called in the cut flower world. That's the little yellow ball. It looks like Gumfrina. It's about, it's a little bit bigger ball than Gumfrina. Um, but it looks, when you look at it closely, the the flower head actually looks like yellow yarrow. It's that same kind of texture and flower touch and um, so very, very useful. And when I first started trying to grow it many years ago, I planted it and I didn't know it was a cool season hardy annual. I planted it in spring and of course they never got tall enough to be worth anything. Then I learned it was a cool season hardy annual so the first year I planted it in very early spring and it was better. But then the last three years we've begun fall planting it and it's wintered over every year, but we definitely have to cover it. And I'll tell you something else about Craspedia. Um, it is deer bait. The deer just really love to eat it to the ground. I would actually think that that's what hap has happened to what's out there currently but I can actually see the dead foliage laying on the film. So this is our backup and it'll be another experiment. The experiment I'm gonna do with stock today is stock, again, is a cool season hardy annual that we do not fall plant. It's not really winter hardy for us. 
here um, very successfully. So we only planted in what is called very early spring. And again, if you've just joined us, um, you can learn more about the Cool Season Hardy Annual Gardening in my book, Cool Flowers, um, which explains the concept and how to figure out. Everybody can plant Cool Season Hardy Annuals. It doesn't matter where you live. We just all plant them at different times. That's the key. Um, so stock, we do not fall plant, and we plant what's called very early spring, which is six to eight weeks. We have transplants ready to go in the garden, six to eight weeks before our last spring frost. Stock is a one and done crop. That means you only get one flower stem per plant. So that means you do not need to give them room. They can be packed into a bed very, very tightly, which not only is an amazing space saver, but the closer you put them together, if you're planting them into nice, you know, well-fed soil, you know, just well, you know, the way you're supposed to prepare soil with a little bit of organic matter, compost and such, that's all the seeds I have, y'all. Actually, let me look. I think I might have another pack. One more. Maybe we can make it, y'all. Um, and I will confess, these are actually last year's seeds. They were um, some that they gave to me from the warehouse because they were last year's. All right. Um, so they're once and done. So you can pack them in. Under normal circumstances, when I'm growing a one and done, one stem and done crop, whether that there's some coxcombs, not all of them, there's some coxcombs and there's stock. We do the same thing. We put eight rows across in a 30 inch bed. Can y'all still see me? Um, Oh, I should ought to turn this around because I'm now smashing that end. Um, my beds are 30 inches. I got to start back here. Um, 30 inches wide. Normally, most crops are four crops wide, but not something like stock and single stem coxcomb. They are one and done. What that means is one flower per one stem for that plant, and when you cut it, that plant is over and done. So there is no need to provide them with room to branch and all that kind of stuff. So we put eight rows, and I still do plant um, in the rows six inches apart, just because that's the easiest spacing because we use the flower support netting for our spacing grid. So with stock, We've done this a couple of times and I'm gonna do it again this year. We're gonna do a test. And instead of putting just one seed into a soil block, we know this works in the larger block. I've done it in the two inch block, put three stock seeds in one block. And then just to plant that one block, not thinning out those three seedlings, just leaving them as I planted them and plant in the same grid. That's all the seeds I have, y'all. We only were short one. Um, so I can still, and you can see the dye is kind of swelling up and getting visible. All right, so that's um, Billy Balls. So I'm gonna be putting three seeds per soil block and we're gonna see how it goes. I'm gonna see, now as I've mentioned, I've done this before in um, two inch blocks, three seeds in one block, um, and planted them out, still eight rows. Think how many stems that is, y'all. Eight rows in a 30 inch wide bed and each plant that's, or each block that's planted has three seeds. This means I could get three times the crop. 
Obviously, nutrition is going to be key. Um, and you know what? This is one of the things, you know, people ask, what is the gar what's going on with the gardener's workshop since we've backed off? We still grow lots of flowers, as you can see, but we're no longer selling flowers. I can do these kinds of things that you and I are doing right here, right now. So let's see how this is going to work. One, two, three. So I am just, this is an experiment, y'all. And stock, I didn't even read the seed packet, stand by. Lightly cover, I hate it when they say that. So I'm just pushing them down in. So this is gonna, wonder how many of these I'll screw up and only put one in because I'll go on automatic pilot, right? So this means that it'll be really interesting to see not only how they grow in the block, if they duke it out or is there enough nutrition and light for them to develop into nice little healthy plants. Um, this will be a groundbreaker because stock is such a useful cut flower. And I'll tell you the other result of packing them in y'all is they grow taller because they're all stretching and fighting for the light, right? So I got to keep my pattern going here or I'm really going to mess up. Um, so this will be a really interesting experiment. It's obviously going to take me longer because I'm putting three seeds into every block. Now, the coxcomb that I mentioned, which is not a cool flower, y'all, that is a warm season, tender annual. Those seeds, those varieties that are singles, because I know that's very confusing to people. You know, we just grow tons of coxcomb. There's two types of coxcomb. Celosia cressida is the botanical name. And there are branching varieties, which we grow a ton of. And there are single stem varieties, which we also grow right much of. So the easiest way on site to recognize which is which, most, and I'm just thinking, I, I feel pretty confident saying all of them, all of the single stem coxcombs are super pricey. I mean, they cost 20 times more than the branching ones do. Like the names of the varieties that are single stem that we love to grow, spring green, which we love. It is that chartreuse green color and gets super ribboned heads. Um, the really big benefit of these super high dollar hybrids is guess what? They are very slow to go to seed, which is what makes them such an excellent cut flower, but you can also see how that contributes to the seed being so pricey because they don't produce seed, right? All the other coxcombs, you have to really become a stellar um, harvester to harvest those heads on time. I don't know if I just put, that may just have two. Um, so what I was gonna say is I don't think I would do what I'm doing right now. This is stock and we're putting three seeds in each block. We would, I've never done this in the small block before. Um, done it in the two inch block and the plants grow beautifully. Then when these three plants per block are planted, they're planted without being separated and we space them the same. Eight rows in a 30 inch bed six inches apart in row. All right, y'all. And this is actually um, another test is that this is cat's stock, which we sell a couple of colors of cats. We're bringing a bunch of other colors on board. Um, they're going to packaging this week, but this is the mix which is kind of a fun thing. Um, I always love growing 
the mix, whenever I start with a new variety of a plant, of a flower, if a mix is available in that variety, I always like to grow the mix because that way you get to see all the colors. Um, sometimes a color that you might not otherwise choose to buy as a solid color really works out great. So for those coxcombs I was speaking of, um, because of the cost of the seed, and we're already, um, those heads were looking to get a little bit bigger. So I would not do this three seeds to a small block or to even to a larger block. Um, pushing them eight singles in a eight rows is about tight enough. And you know, you can really think, that means you get twice as much production from a square foot, right? Um, you know, as a small urban farmer that does not have endless land, I'm always looking to squeeze the most out of every single bed. Well, how'd you get in there? There's a billy ball in the middle of that. Um, So I'm going to take you in the grow room when we're done with this. And you're going to see the straw flowers and the stock that you and I started here two weeks ago. The YouTube um, video from, I think it was the 15th. And you can see the progression. And I am purposely kind of keeping my room just a smidgen cooler than what I would like for it to be for growing vegetatively um, because I don't want my plants to get ready too soon. You know, you can really manipulate your growing situation, y'all. It's all about the air temperature. You can, I don't know if y'all can hear the heat going on and off in this building. Um, so I've been keeping the room, the grow room door closed so it gets warm in there because we need some warmth, right? But um, I can see that we're not gonna be planting at Valentine's Day, which is the beginning of my window. It'll be more like early 1st of March. So I don't want anybody getting too big. I would much rather, y'all, the whole secret to great seed starting or to the end result of a great seed starting season is for you to have your spot ready and waiting to receive your transplants and for you to have to wait for your plants to maybe get a little bit bigger before you plant them. There is nothing more torturous. I just thought about something. I think I'm gonna go to two plants per block. We might as well make this a real experiment and see because if the three per block don't perform well, Let's see if two does, and that'll also help me to speed up here, right? Um, that'll be a great comparison. Anyway, um, you it's much nicer for you to have to wait on your seedlings maybe to grow just a little bit bigger before you plant them out than, heaven forbid, now my seed moved up, um, you to have seedlings that are growing out of your block. And for whatever reason, whether you aren't ready or there's you know 20 inches of snow out there, um, you can't plant your plants, your seedlings, and they start growing into these ugly transplants. Well, there's not really much you can do other than cool your air temperature off. Um, air temperature is a very common reason people ask me, you know, my plants don't grow as fast as yours. What, what's the difference? Well, the whole environment, but a common problem is that their air temperature is just too cool. And like people, for instance, trying to grow in a garage at this time of the year, the air temperature is just not conducive to vegetative growth. Um, you got to have warmer air temps if you want your seedlings 
to grow. So what I've been doing to manipulate and slow my growing down is I'm keeping the air temp a little bit cooler in there. So you'll be able to see um, the straw flowers that first day that we started to gather the peach mix um, are looking really, really good. And we started, I think, some cat's white. Y'all, you know what's wrong with my toothpick. It needs more saliva. All right, let me turn around. Almost done here. So this is the best way. See how the seeds are scattered in the tray? You're, it's easier to pick up an individual one when they're scattered like that instead of if you had enough seeds to like fill your tray up, that's not, or your little pan, that's not really the best way to do this. Um, you just wanna be able to pick it up. And the same thing I find true when I'm doing seeds like zinnias and marigolds, I don't use the pan. I literally dump those seeds into my hand. And so we're putting two seeds, this is stock. And while the other end of the tray, I put three seeds per block as an experiment. We're doing two seeds at this end and we're gonna still plant the individual block at the spacing that I normally grow stock in, but we're trying to see just how tight can we get them. Um, and I'm feeling pretty confident that I think the three seeds per block's gonna work, just based on past experience. The key will be to not start, to be able to plant them out in the garden as soon as they're ready, meaning to have a spot ready and waiting for them um, so they don't have to sit in the block and start getting overgrown because friends, I'm telling you, there is nothing worse than that. Um, and again, you can manipulate the rate that your seedlings grow by your air temperature. Um, And these do go onto a seedling heat mat. And with all the cool season hardy annuals, the cool flowers, I use a cookie cooling rack, which you're gonna see here in just a moment. We only have one more cluster after I finish this one. Um, I use cool season hardy annuals, um, do need some consistent warmth to warm the soil up some, but the, the um, Heat mat gets a little smidgen too warm. So we have found that using those cookie cooling racks just creates enough of an air space between the heat mat and the bottom of the tray that it cools it off just enough. And we've had really good luck with that. You know, just trying to find the simplest, easiest, quickest way to pretty much do everything. And again, I just wanna say some of my friends that aren't soil blockers, so they don't soil block, say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you sit there and do what I'm doing right now. But friends, after this, all we do is water and move the, the trays from heat to light and then from light outdoors to harden off and they get planted. And let me just add that planting soil blocks is so much quicker than dealing with plug trays. Um, you literally pick up the entire cluster of 20 by the plants gently, place them on your palm, and then you just literally break them off. And it's quick and efficient. And then in addition to that, there's no root bound roots to deal with. Um, so there's just a lot of great reason Everybody tends to like the method that they learned with. So, you know, I use plug trays, right? I mean, I'm not a purist of any stretch of the imagination. We use plug trays to start sunflowers. There are some plug trays in on the floor of the grow room waiting for heat mat space. Bobo started um, 
Calendula is another crop that is borderline for my zone. And I'll be honest, the plants were, did not look really great when we planted them. They just weren't very happy for whatever reason. So I am pretty assured that we have lost all of them that were fall planted. So Bobo started three trays um, of them for us to start. All right, we're done, friends. So first off, I gotta put this back in. You know, I, I don't tend to my seeds immediately. Oh, and guess what? We did not put tape. See, I need to have like a supervisor, y'all. So this was Cats Mix 129. All right, so I'm gonna put tape on this and we're gonna carry these into the grow room. So back when I first was, you know, a gardener gone wild and was becoming a flower farmer, I did all this in my house on my bar in my kitchen and I live in a bungalow, y'all, think about that. Um, and my pantry and so but now when we built this building that i'm sitting in um i'm just gonna turn you back up here um this building that i'm sitting in was built in 2002 that was five years four years into my farming efforts um, and it has a 10 by 10 grow room um, i'm in the city i cannot have cannot have any structures no hoop or greenhouses um, i mean i'm literally surrounded by a fat 200,000 residents. So I have this great 10 by 10 grow room. Fortunately, we knew what the room was going to be used for. So the room has a drain in the middle, but you could definitely, there's a thousands of people doing what you're about to see in my grow room, doing it in a spare bedroom or in a basement or in a cellar or what have you. So I am going to um, pick you up. So stand by for just a minute while you get not such a great view of everything <laughs> and I'm going to take you into the grow room and I'm taking just one tray I'll bring the others in in a few minutes so this room um, has my heat mats let me just stand you up here for a minute um, so I'll bring you back actually and show you the big picture of the room I don't think y'all have ever seen it I lose track of who I have told what to um, so this is my grow room and you can see it's just got the windows are obsolete because we don't rely on that at all. Um, I didn't know when we built this building, I just didn't, we didn't need to put those windows in is what I'm saying to you. They do, all they do is heat this room up. So the question that people see right now, see how close those shelves are to those lights and see how far apart those are. That is the difference in the type of light bulb. Those are T12s. Those are the ones that we sell. They're the ones that I prefer. That's why we sell them. Because you can see I've lost shelf real estate over on that rack. Those are T5s. And they will cook your seedlings if they're any closer than that. I always have to point that out because I get that question a lot. I bought them before I knew what was going on? Let me get the light a little bit better in here. That didn't really help, did it? Um, anyway, these are the ones I prefer. I lost three shelves over there. Um, three shelves times 750 soil blocks per shelf is a major hit when you are um, a commercial grower. So, um, so this room is heated and air conditioned like the rest of my building. Um, and during, and I can control that temperature in here even more by closing or opening this door. So I've kind of, you know, it's just like everybody needs to like find the sweet spot on your, for your situation. So let's just take a really quick look here at the heat mat. So this is my table that has, this is one of our jumbo heat mats underneath here. Um, and it has a built-in thermostat. And so this is the burlap. We don't use domes. I was never, um, the person I learned seed starting from really felt like domes were very difficult to monitor to prevent disease and dampening off fungus and stuff. 
So we um, use this wide weave burlap that allows air to get through, but yet it retains moisture. And literally it just lays on top of the trays. And so some of these were just started. Um, these are, you can see these are starting to crack. All of these Bobo started yesterday. Um, and so, and you can see underneath here is, look over here, cookie cooling rack. Um, and so we will add this tray here to this. This gets watered every morning. Oh, the whole room gets watered every morning, once a day. And when I come out to water, the seedlings should be dry. So these are, this is what we started um, together on the 15th. So that was two weeks ago. That's the straw flower. And down here is, um, this is the stock that we started. And you can see they're up. And um, then all of these others have been started since then. And this one, can you see that? These I just took off the heat this morning. You can see they're just starting to crack. So the way I'm kind of holding these seedlings back is by keeping this room a little bit cool. So when I come out here in the morning, um, the way I know it's too cool for healthy growth is if these have just been watered, if the blocks are not dry when I go to water. You don't ever want to keep your blocks moist 24-7. You want them to go through the wet to dry so go through the wet to dry cycle in a 24 hour period. Um, and if it's wet in the morning when I came out here, which doesn't typically happen for us because of all these windows, that means the air temperature is not warm enough. You need to bump it up some. You can see that we have our monitoring tool here. This is the yellow sticky trap, monitoring for fungus gnats. Um, and then on Wednesdays, I add natural, which is a biocide. Um, it's a larvicide. It kills um, the larva of fungus gnats, which get it, or they lay their eggs in the soil. And so we start a prevention program immediately after. Um, wait a minute, y'all. Oh, sorry. Trying not this. Trying to put you in the tripod. Um, we start using the prevention program the minute we fire this room up. If you wait and you get fungus nets, it's much more difficult to get a grip on them and they're a reality of seed starting. So I am, um, I'm gonna look and see if I can't, oh, I can. So creatively, Candace at Flower and Vegetable Gardening Natural was a game changer for me. I just wished it wasn't so expensive. Well, that would be me and you both. So why? Welcome to live chat. Remember to guard. So I'm trying to see all of. <laughs> so I y'all, if you have a question about, um, oh there they are. So I'm just looking to see if there's any. Um, questions on here. Yeah, I totally uh, agree about soul blocking is easier. So Aaron asks, when do you thin the three seedlings down to one? No, that's the point. We are not thinning them. Um, when, for all other, um, whenever we normally sow, it's just one seed per block. And these we are sowing three per block intentionally because they're a one and done crop. And so they will be um, actually planted just like that. So somebody is asking um, Tweed Thistle Farm, Lisa, will you back off the feeding if you're trying to hold the plant back, the plants back at all? Yes, that's another good point. If I am up against not able to plant for whatever reason, um, then cool temps and stop feeding them. First of March, I am too far ahead with my seedlings. I plan on the same schedule as Lisa. So, you know, friends, figuring out timing is so, um, so very, very difficult that, um, 
you just have to do it and figure it out and then make notes for your own personal um, kind of situation, what your growing conditions are. Y'all saw, sorry, I'm reading and talking at the same time. Oh. All right, now it's going to make me go through them again. I have to figure this out, y'all. I'm not sure how to keep. I have to keep. I can hardly walk and chew gum at the same high on earth. Are you planting three tiny seeds per block and keeping track? Lots of practice. Susan Gordon, any idea when and if eucalyptus seeds will be available? Yeah, Susan, they've been out of stock um, for probably 16 months. We only grow silver drop. And that's the only one that we offer. Um, and I am not separating the stock seeds and the block, Susan. Um, and so rumor has it every year that they'll be available this spring, but time will tell. So you, there is no insider trading, nobody. That, they are not available from whoever's growing them. They're, we all buy them from the same place. Um, I'm just looking for the question, y'all. So Carol is asking, will the seedlings stay in the small block for six weeks? Um, a kind of standard operating procedure with soil blocking is um, that you shave a third of the growing time off. So it's something that you grow typically for six weeks and a plug tray, it would be four weeks in this. And yes, we don't bump up. So friends, I think I've answered most of your questions. Post them and I will do my best to get back. We, we do surf them. Um, and so I'm trying to come to you on Saturday mornings at 11. So please subscribe and share with your friends and um, tell others about us. And, you know, just join me for this little journey of, um, you know, some experiments as well as what we're actually planting out in our garden. So if you want to learn more about me and how ways you can connect with me, go to thegardenersworkshop.com. We're an online garden shop and a learning center. We have online courses, farming schools, gardening classes, um, and we only sell the same tool seeds and supplies that I use. So friends, till we meet again, ciao.